uh, as a refresher, since it's been a while, um, you know, we were talking about uh, doing stoichiometric balances and uh, working towards net reactions and maximum theoretical yield calculations. And I know that you are actually more fresh uh, with this topic than would be ordinarily true based on our lectures just because of homework three, which probably a lot of you have worked on recently. Um, so this is going to start with the strategy of thinking again about these metabolic pathways and lumping them, which is effectively what we were doing uh, for homework three. And we're working towards a, a version where actually all of these net reactions could just be in a model, uh, in a stoichiometric model uh, that could be a digital file within a framework that can perform some kind of optimization um, or calculations. Um, and there are many programs to do that. Um, so we know that there are these pathways and under uh, Matrix framework, there's an emphasis on these 12 key metabolites. There are actually, I think, only or uh, 11 red dots here. But um, you have these precursor metabolites, um, and they connect to your other parts of metabolism. They're listed here. Um, all things that I think we've now covered, especially as last time as we went through the TCA cycle and performed our balances there. Um, you will recognize all of these. Um, so uh, you can then think about how your pathways are different based on what your carbon source is. For everything that we have been talking about so far, uh, we've been starting with glucose um, as our uh, sole carbon source. Um, and that makes sense. That's the most logical, the most industrially and physiologically relevant. Um, but uh, there are a couple of different perspectives here. One is that uh, you could have an alternative sh sugar carbon source. You could have something like glycerol um, or, say, acetate, um, which is uh, something of interest to professors Antoni Wish and Papadzakis at Delaware. Uh, and when you don't have glucose or uh, another hexose type of sugar, um, you have glucose gluconeogenesis, um, and you can see effectively your fluxes have all changed. And I think that's one of the things that you want that is intended to be uh, really illustrated here is that, um, you know, if you're trying to quantify the actual flow um, uh, of, of carbon through these steps, which our sort of lumped models haven't really accounted for yet, um, the directionality and what pathways are active are all very dependent on that. And so you can see that here um, in, a, in what I find a more visually compelling strategy that you'll see in the literature um, a lot associated with metabolic flux analysis. Um, so if you notice here it, below the legend, um, this is metabolic flux, which um, we're talking about in units of moles, uh, per mass, per time. Um, and so we're, we're considering here uh, not just the reactions involved, but the actual volume of, of traffic, you could say, um, going through the different streets uh, or highways. If any of you um, saw Jamie Young's presentation uh, before, he was one of the last seminars before the break, um, he gave, he, he provided a really interesting set of analogies where you can imagine, for example, glycolysis, like the superhighway, um, but you really want to be quantifying uh, not just how many cars are on the highway, but how fast are the cars moving? Um, because, you know, he had better illustrations than I have, but you can sort of imagine this on, superimposed onto this chart. Uh, you could have a lot of cars piled up in a traffic jam, or you could just have really empty streets. Um, but what these numbers here really indicate uh, is, is that movement of, of molecules and carbon through these different steps. 
And so right away, you can see, for example, when you grow on glucose, uh, you have these wider arrows, the width of which are supposed to be proportional to the fluxes. Um, so you have a lot more flux going through glycolysis than you do through pentose phosphate ordinarily. Um, and you can also see how the citric acid cycle starts to, starts to have less because so much of your flux from pyruvate goes to acetate. And, and so you could do these kind of analyses to understand what bacteria naturally do uh, or other organisms. And it's, it's source, carbon source dependent, but also assumes that you haven't done any engineering. And that's going to be important for later. Um, here you can see, on the other hand, what happens when, you know, acetate is your carbon source. And you can see just how much more flux goes through the TCA cycle. And then how these steps have such a dramatically different rate um, and directionality of, of carbon flux. Um, any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. All right, so we know, uh, just like from homework three and our, our exercise in class before, that we can lump different steps in and then end up with these, you could call them net, partial net reactions. Um, and so the way Machek frames it here is that you can think about these lumped multi-step pathways the way that we have been doing, where you manually add everything up. And then this alternative method is flux balance analysis. And I think that makes sense, and there's probably more to what Machek was trying to say here. Um, but flux balance analysis is, um, is a tool for doing more than just adding up reactions. I think um, it would be very difficult, for example, to do any kind of optimization or gene knockout predictions with just this sort of manual approach. So we've already seen the manual approach, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on these slides. Um, you know, this is just like what you were doing for your homework, um, where you can add up all these reactions, you add up with your lumped or partial net reaction. Okay, so then this is flux balance analysis, um, where you apply a few more principles of chemical engineering, which assume that you're probably gonna have a really large um, set of reactions. So it's more scalable in the stoichiometric matrix linear algebra framework. Um, you can set, a f uh, so you can, you can consider things in terms of fluxes, um, and you'll see where uh, that comes in. Uh, what you also have is your stoichiometric matrix, which is um, just your stoichiometric coefficients, um, where your columns are the number of reactions, and then your rows. Um, are, are based on the number of chemicals, um, and then you have this, this uh, flux vector. Um, and so you'll see this illustrated in a moment. But if you take the example that we were just looking at, glucose, ATP, NADH, pyruvate from glycolysis and this uh, net reaction, you can, you can see how these numbers haven't changed. Um, and effectively, what you're doing is just representing everything uh, in this vectorial uh, format where you're just performing metabolite balances and you're assuming uh, really no accumulation. Um, so pseudo steady state. Uh, and this is, this is what it can look like um, in a very simplified case. I actually have a version to show you guys later, depending on how far we get, of, of what one of these models uh, or one, at least an input file looks like for, for uh, one of these models, 